Hello, welcome to this video on building a Node.js application using SQL Server end-to-end. -end. In this tutorial, you'll learn the basics of creating a Node.js application with SQL Server by creating a simple calendar app. To give you an idea of what you'll be creating, your application will be a simple event calendar that, that uses Vue.js and Material CSS on the front end, secured with a login to allow new users to register for their own account, and the front end will communicate with your secure API to create and delete events. I'm excited to step you through this project, so let's get started. Before we get started on the code, uh, we need to make sure that you've got a couple of things that are required to complete this tutorial. First is you need to have Node.js installed. And you can check that in a couple of ways. One is to open up a command prompt or terminal, depending on what operating system you're using, and type in the command node-v. And this should print out to the console the version of Node that you have. If you get an error message or if the version of Node that you have installed is below maybe version 10, then you're going to want to install an updated version. And you can do that by going to nodejs.org and clicking on the big green download button. If you're on uh, Mac or Linux or if you're using the Unix or Linux um, uh, subsystem for Windows, I highly recommend that you install NVM and that is the Node Version Manager. And it, this gives you a command line option and it makes it so much easier to work with uh, upgrading Node and uh, being able to install multiple versions of Node. Like on my system, if I do NVM LS, I see that I've got uh, version 12 and version 13 installed and I can switch easily from one to the other. And I can also do upgrades. Um, the other thing that you need to have installed or access to is SQL Server. And um, if you have access to a development instance of SQL Server, that's great. Uh, if you need a local instance, then there's a couple of ways you can do that. One is if you're on Windows and you're comfortable with installing something like SQL Server, um, you can go download the um, uh, SQL Server um, Developer Edition. I used to use this a lot when I was developing uh, .NET applications on Windows, and uh, it works fine. It's got all the all the features that you can possibly need with SQL Server. But if you're on Mac or Linux, or if you don't want to um, mess with uh, installing a, a a complicated server application like SQL Server, then you can use Docker. If you don't already have Docker installed, you can go to docker.com and and go through um, the uh, options to find Docker uh, to download. Uh, there's a free community edition that, that works fine, uh, and that's what we'll be using in this tutorial. And um, so I'm going to step you through uh, how to install Docker or how to install SQL Server using Docker. So the first step is to uh, make sure that Docker is running. So if you got Docker, um, you should have some uh, uh, commands that you can use. Um, and it appears that I do not have Docker running. I recently uh, upgraded my my system, and so Docker is uh, needs to be installed. All right, so I've got to install it too. Looky here. Let me uh, let me install this real quick, and then uh, I'll get back into the video. All right, so now I've got Docker installed, and I'm ready to uh, continue. So the first thing you need to do is pull down the latest Docker image for SQL Server. And you do that by using the docker pull command. 
and the full command is docker pull microsoft slash ms sql dash server dash linux colon 2017 dash latest and when you run this the first time it should take um, a few minutes depending on your bandwidth how much what your download speed is it'll download the image and uh, you can run this again anytime and and if there's an update to the image it will download the latest version. Once you have the image downloaded, then you need to create an instance of that image as a container and use the uh, the docker run command for that. Uh, the docker run command in this case is going to be um, dash D to create a background uh, daemon um, uh, so that the server runs in the background all the time. Uh, without having to have Docker running or without having to have this running in the terminal. Uh, we're specifying the name of SQL Server so that um, you can easily start and stop by using the name SQL Server. Um, and then there's some environment variables that we have to pass. Uh, one is the to accept the EULA uh, and the other is to set the uh, password for the system admin account. And you can change that to whatever it is that you you want to change that to. Um, we're setting the, the SQL uh, product identifier to the developer edition of uh, SQL Server. And then we're mapping some ports. So by default, SQL Server runs on port 1433. And so we're mapping our local 1433 to the containers 1433. And then finally, we're uh, specifying to use the image Microsoft SQL Server Linux 2017 latest as the uh, uh, image to uh, create this from. Um, I already have a, a container named SQL Server, um, so it's given me an error. I could back up here and and give this another name and create a second instance of SQL Server, but I'm I'm not going to do that. All right. So, but I do need to start it when you run. Uh, or do Docker run, it's going to um, uh, start that server automatically after it creates it. I need to actually call Docker start SQL server. And now my SQL server instance is running as well. Now, um, next thing we need to do is to create our SQL server database and, um, and this, you know, create uh, some a table and seed some data into it. Um, to do that, I'm going to use a tool called Azure Data Studio. Um, you can do actually do this from inside Visual Studio Code if you're using that as your editor. Uh, there's a plugin for it. But I'm going to show you real quick how uh, where to go look for that. Um, so if you search for um, Azure Data Studio, you should land on this page, and you can. Uh, find instructions on, on an installer for your operating system, if it's a zip file or an installer for Windows. Um, so download this application, if you don't already have it, and install it, and then we'll get started on the next step. All right, so if you install Azure Data Studio and launch it, you should see a a window that looks similar to this. We're going to create a new connection to our SQL Server database. So the server will be localhost. We're going to use SQL login authentication. Username, we can use uh, the system admin and then the password that was passed to the uh, Docker command when we initialized our container. And we can check the box to remember the password. And there are some other options, but uh, we're just going to go ahead and connect with this. All right, now we're connected to the database, and we need to um, create a database for our application. You can use Command N or Control N to create a new uh, query window, and in here we're going to issue some uh, some commands. So. We're on the master database right now. We can say create database. Uh, I'm going to call it Cal. Actually, I, I've already got a database named Calendar. So I'm going to drop that. 
and F5. Don't do this in production, right? This is, we're, we're able to do this because we're in development. So now I'm going to, this is the, uh, this is the command I want you to run. Create database calendar. Go. Press F5. That's executed the query. And now you can change your uh, current database to calendar. So now inside, you know, make sure that you are in the calendar database. If you want to double check, say use calendar and, and press F5. And that will switch your current connection over to the calendar database. You don't want to do this on the master database. So now we need to create a, a table for our um, calendar events. And we're going to have an identity column that just automatically increments. And we're also going to specify this is the uh, primary key for the table. And uh, this value cannot be null. We're going to add a user ID in bar card. 20, uh, 50, and it cannot be null. A title. Not null. A description. A description is a keyword. So for SQL Server, we're going to wrap that in brackets so that uh, SQL Server knows that we're, we're using this as a an identifier for our, our table uh, label uh, column instead of uh, using a keyword. Let's make this in var car a thousand. It can be null. We need a start date of type date that is not null. Now, um, and then a start time. And I'm splitting these out separately just so that um, it makes it um, a little bit easier to deal with the data that's stored so that we don't have to uh, extract parts out of the date, uh, the time part. Um, we're just going to have these things be separate in the database. That way you could have a date, like an all-day event kind of thing as a start date without a time associated with it and uh, not have to you know, have a flag for that or have the time be specified as, you know, 12 a.m. and assume that means it's uh, a date or a, an all-day thing. And then we're going to have an end date that is a type date that is null, nullable, and then an end time. We're also going to want to go ahead and add an index for this table. I mean, it's overkill for a, a tutorial, but I, I want you to know that you can specify indexes at, when you create a, a new table um, using it. You, know, you can name it whatever you want to, but I always like to have a convention of IDX for index, the name of the table and the name of the columns that are included in that index. Um, I just know ahead of time that we're going to do some queries based on the user ID and SQL Server uh, likes to have some hints or likes to have indexes for performance for performance uh, that'll make this much better down the road. All right, we've got our our full create table command here. We'll press F5, or you can go up here and press the run. And now the table is created. If I try to create the table again, it tells me that there's already an object named events in the database. If you want, you can specify, uh, like if you have some, uh, some uh, DDL um, type statements, like if you have a, a script file that, that you may want to put in production, like uh, or a migration file, you can do things like drop table if exists events and run that. I mean, um, 
just know that if you have that in there, then it's going to it's going to drop that table. So that if there's any data in that table, um, it's it's gone. And this is good uh, or useful in development when you want to just start over clean with a fresh copy of your database with with all the tables that you might create. All right, we're through setting up a SQL Server. One more step. I want to go ahead and add a couple of rows in here that we're going to um, want some data to play with later on in when we're setting up the application. Start into events. User ID, title, description, start date, start time. Those are all our columns. And then our values. We're going to say well, user 1234. This is a, a appointment. description stuff and our start time is going to be um, our start date will be uh, March 31st and time will be 2.30 p.m. and the end will be I'm going to say null and null for the end date and time uh, let's go ahead and add a second row same user one two three four. We'll say it's an online conference. Uh, no description. This will be on. We'll start on April the first. There's no start time, and we'll end on April the second. No end time. So now if I run all of this, it will recreate the uh, the table for me and also um, insert two rows into this database. Now we've got the database set up and ready to go. Let's dive into some Node.js code. All right, switch back over to your terminal or command line, and we're going to set up a, a directory for our project. Um, change to whatever directory that you you store your your projects in. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to create something in my project demos folder. So make their node call it whatever you like, and then change to that directory. And the first thing you need to do when you're setting up a Node.js project is you need to initialize uh, that folder. You use the command npm init dash y if you want to accept the defaults. If you don't specify dash y, then uh, Node will prompt you to answer several questions about the name of the project and your contact information and, and uh, the license and so forth. All these things... Um, can be you can set these defaults using the npm command. So if you go search for npm init defaults, you should be able to find um, how to set the defaults for things like the the version and uh, the author and, and the type of license you want to have for every project going forward. All right. So now, basically, what npm init does is it creates this package JSON file for us, uh, gives us a starting point for adding the dependencies that we need for the project. Uh, when you use Node.js, uh, there are lots of great frameworks that you can choose from to build web applications. Um, Express is one of, uh, is probably the most well-known and, and popular. In this tutorial, I'm going to use Happy. Uh, it's my personal favorite. And it was originally created by Walmart engineers, uh, suitable for building APIs and services and complete web applications. So in this prompt, we're going to run npm install 
happy, happy. I was going to download some dependencies and, and get that, uh, that first happy instance set up. Um, uh, you may want to specify, uh, just to make sure that if you're watching this video and, um, maybe it's sometime in the future, uh, just for compatibility, you may want to specify, uh, add it on to the end and at 19 to, to, to lock down a particular version of, of happy in case there's a breaking change in a later update that doesn't work with this, uh, the code in this video. So happy, happy at 19. The other thing that I like to do when I'm setting up a new Node.js application is to use uh, ESLint. ESLint's going to alert me to common mistakes, uh, JavaScript issues, errors, uh, things that could cause me pain um, if I don't uh, like um, initialize my variables or, or something like that. So ESLint is a is a great way to do that. And um, so also use npm install, but this is a developer dependency. This is not something we would put into production. So you want to use the save-dev flag. And um, I'm going to use ESLint and ESLint config reverent geek. These, this is my own, um, you don't have to use this, but this is my own like collection of ESLint rules that I like to have uh, that helps me to format the code consistently and, and some other things. So we'll wait for this to install. ESLint uh, needs to know what kind of rules to use. So I'm going to create a file called .eslintrc. .js, and I'm going to put into this code file um, the the set of rules that I want to uh, ESLint to to use when I'm linting my code. Um, I've got my own config for that, and I can never remember uh, what the uh, how to, what the settings are. So here's a a tip: you can type npm docs and any um, package and it will automatically open up the uh, the readme for that package so I can uh, know that hey I need to create a config file and put uh, these these this rule set in here so this is the one that I want it's for node.js and now I can switch over to uh, Visual Studio Code that I'm going to be using. And inside this ESLint RCJS, I'm going to add my um, module exports that tells ESLint uh, what to do. All right, if you um, were curious about what I, what I did to launch uh, Visual Studio Code, there, you can also add this uh, code as a command line parameter. If you uh, press Command Shift P, that brings up the uh, uh, the palette. And if you type in the word install, you'll see that one of the options is uh, the shell command to install code in your path. So if you're working from the command line, you can type code anywhere, and it's going to launch that current folder. Um, in your Visual Studio Code editor. Really handy. All right. So now we've got that. Um, we want to create our first um, Node.js web server with Happy. Let's create... Um, I like to organize my code, uh, uh, everything for my servers under a source folder. So we're going to create a new folder called source. And in here... I'm going to create a new file named index.js. Now you may be wondering uh, why I'm using use strict at the top. And um, because you may know already that in the browser, if you're using 
any modern JavaScript, uh, if you're using like the imports, exports, uh, the module type settings that you don't have to use, use strict if you're using modules in on the front end. But for Node.js, um, modules in the in that sense of using like the import exports uh, uh, syntax for for things um, that's not a yet yeah, a default. And if you don't specify use strict, then you're uh, you're not running in strict mode. Whereas in the browser, strict mode is is pretty much guaranteed to to be uh, run all the time if you're using uh, modules. If you're using a transpiler like B Babel, uh, it's going to add you strict to the top of all your files uh, automatically. But Node, this is something that we need to do today. So we're going to require in uh, our server module, which we'll create in just a moment. And we need a start server function. Wrap this around a try catch. We're going to create a config object. Specify our host is local hosts and port is 8080. Create an app. We're going to wait on our server. Passing in our config, and we're going to await server.start. Server running at And now we just need to set our catch statement. And finally, we'll call start server. So our asynchronous function that creates, um, oh, this should be app.start, not server.start. You saw, you may have seen, um, so this is where ESLint uh, helps me to keep making stupid mistakes. So um, the squiggly underline under app indicates that app is declared, but its value has never, never been used. Like, Oh, well, I put in the wrong thing. It should be app.start. And so now everything goes back to not being uh, read again. All right, so we got our, our index. Now we need to create our server module. Again, starting with use strict. And we're going to require in our happy module. I'm going to specify requiring in a routes module, which we'll, we'll create in just a moment. Again, um, if you're creating a hello world application, you could put everything into one index.js file and, and make it work. But that's not going to serve you really well going forward. So uh, I like to organize my code in um, even in the beginning into things like separate server.js, which will make server.js uh, easy to test later. Um, separating out, separating out things like my routes, uh, plugins, which are uh, the equivalent of middleware uh, that you may have used middleware for Express if you've ever played with Express. Uh, plugins is what uh, Happy uses, and um, you know just different sections of code uh, into their separate files because I know over time as a, as the project grows, I'm going to want those uh, kinds of 
disciplines in the project. And uh, there's, there's unfortunately not a whole lot of guidance out there on how to set up um, projects. And um, it's all a preference thing. You know, there's no one set way of, of um, defining what Node.js projects are supposed to look like. That's one of the beauties of, of Node and JavaScript. You can, you can do things the way that you want, the way you like them. Um, all right. So now we've got our routes um, uh, module imported. We're going to create our app that takes is a, a synchronous function. It takes in a config. We're going to destructure the host and the port off of the config object and create an instance of our happy server using the host and port. Next, uh, we're going to store the config on the uh, server.app instance. And this will come in handy later on in the project. I, I know ahead of time that we're going to want to find some things like the SQL Server connection information. We're going to put that all on the config object later on. And then from anywhere inside the application at any time, we can use server.app.config to get to those configuration values, uh, which is really handy. And then finally, uh, we'll use our uh, register our routes, passing in the server, and then finally return server. And last but not least, we need to set our module.export. This is the magic that uh, for of common JS that allows us to uh, um, expose to the outside world, to, to anything that consumes this module. That's what helps us to expose uh, what uh, objects or functions or uh, classes, if you want to use classes, um, are available when you import that module. All right. Um, now we're still missing one thing, and that's our routes. So I'm going to create in my source folder a new folder called routes because I know I'm going to be adding multiple routes or collections of routes at some point. And uh, in the routes folder, create an index.js. Again, use strict. And we're just going to module.exports. We can just say we, we need just one function called register that takes in a server and uses server to register a route. A method is get path is the route. So we're setting up. What this is doing is setting up a, a route that's listening for a, like the default document. So the um, when you go to localhost 8080 without specifying a, a route name or anything, this is what's going to serve that up. And then we need to define a handler, which is a an asynchronous function. Um, happy passes in a request object and uh, this request toolkit. For whatever reason, it, it just, they call it H. I guess it's short for happy, uh, but it's the request toolkit that has lots of things um, that that are like utility functions and all kinds of cool stuff. But um, we're not going to use either one of those in this hello world type uh, first instance. So we're just going to return the text, my first happy server. And we're done. Now one thing before we run this is we want to go into package JSON and change the main to uh, to, to look for source slash index.js. This is um, 
so if you run node at the command line, uh, it's going to know where to find the, uh, the entry point for the application. So now you can start the application. We'll, we'll do that by going to the command line and typing in node and a period. And, uh, oh, I must have messed up something with the, uh, the output. Uh, let's switch over real quick. Uh, I forgot my dollar sign. You probably saw me do that. All right. Those are a template strings, a template, uh, template little temp, template literals in JavaScript. So let's press. I'll do Control C to stop it and run it again. Now I got the the text that I expected, and you can you know copy and paste this into your browser, whatever. Uh, the, the terminal settings that I have, I can use command click on a, a URL, which is really handy. And um, when you browse to the URL, you should see the text, my first happy server. Sweet. Success. Your first uh, Node.js happy server. All right. Let's go back and stop that server. You can press control C. Now, before we get into writing code to interact with SQL Server, we need a good way to manage our application's configuration, such as the, the SQL Server configuration or SQL Server connection information. Node.js applications typically use environment variables for configuration. However, managing actual environment variables can be quite a pain, especially if you're on a on Windows. Um, so there is a module that we can use uh, in Node.js called .env that exposes uh, an env configuration file to Node as if they were actual environment variables. So uh, for us to get started on this, we need to install uh, .env as a dependency. And here I'm specifying version 8 because that's the, the version that, uh, the latest version that's going to work with this particular uh, project. And now we need to create a .env file. And you could create this in Visual Studio Code. I like using the touch command on, on Mac. It's just convenience. So now we have a an env file that's empty and we need to put some configuration information in here. So I like to specify the, uh, it's a common thing to have a, a node environment uh, variable. And you definitely want to set node env equal to production uh, when you deploy an application to production. That's going to give you a lot better performance. Now we need to specify our happy server config. So port equals 8080. Host equals local host. I'm going to go ahead and specify a host URL. Uh, just as a shortcut, I know I'll need this later. And then also, uh, later on in the application, in this tutorial, we're going to add uh, security, some uh, authentication to our app, and we're going to use cookie uh, sessions, cookie-based sessions, to, uh, to manage that security. So I need to specify, if I can type, uh, a server, a cookie encrypt password. And this can be, this can be whatever you want. You can be just a big long string of gibberish. You want something that's that's secure. Uh, it does need to be at least 32 characters long. So I'm just going to call it my super awesome password string that is at least 32 characters 
Um, change it to whatever you, you want. And now we need some SQL uh, server config. We need to specify our SQL user is um, in production you're definitely going to have different credentials set up for uh, your application so you you do not ever use the system admin account in production but for development um, we can we can get away with it um, if you're real peculiar uh, or if you're using a a, a database server that's hosted somewhere else like if you're using a development instance of sql server in your organization for for example you you probably don't have the sa password account anyway so um, you're going to use whatever developer account that you have so specify that i need to specify the sql database calendar we need to specify the SQL server name in our in this case I'm using localhost but this will be whatever if you're using a, a development server that's uh, hosted somewhere else you can put that in there and then uh, something that you'll need if if ever you want to deploy this application to Azure you need to set uh, SQL encrypt equal to true for Azure. Uh, if you're for local development, you're going to set this to false. And then finally, I'm going to go ahead and add some Opta config in here because later on uh, in the application, um, we're going to add authentication to the app so that people can log in and uh, enter dates for their own thing. And we're going to need, at some point, an Okta org URL and an Okta client ID. We'll change these later. An Okta client secret. Another thing to point out is that um, if you're using a source control system like Git, you do not add this .env file to your source control. You need to ignore, set it to ignore this file because each, each environment requires a custom ENV, like different SQL Server connection information, different port or host information, and you don't want to expose any of these uh, secrets in uh, your GitHub repository so that other people could find them, especially if you're creating an open source project, right? You don't want to accidentally check in a file that includes, hey, here's my SQL database inf connection information or my uh, uh, client secret uh, for authentication. Now, typically what um, open source projects will do is create a a separate .env sample file that includes placeholders, um, and then in the README we'll say you need to you make you need to make a copy of this file, rename it to .env, and uh, change all the uh, values to be for your environment. All right, so we're gonna to use this configuration information. We're gonna create a new file under source called config.js and we're going to pull in our .env module and there's one thing uh, you have to run the uh, the config function on .env and this is going to read in that .env file and then um, add all the environment, all those values that are in there 
to the uh, Node.js process uh, so that it looks like to Node uh, that these are environment variables that are set in the, in the environment. Um, let's pull off, because environment variables are always uh, uppercase, um, we're going to pull off all these values and return something that's a little more palatable for um, Node.js or JavaScript. So instead of dealing with uh, all these uppercase values. So we're going to pull off port, host, host URL, the cookie, encrypt, password, SQL Server, SQL Database, SQL User, Pull those off of the process.env, um, which is uh, Node.js's built-in uh, environment. That's how it exposes environment variables uh, inside the, any Node.js application. We're going to check our SQL encrypt value. Bill. And now we'll um, export all this configuration mapping all these values to uh, things that make more sense. like SQL, we'll create that as a, a separate, like an object within the object. This will make it easier late down the road. Also going to specify um, the uh, the version of SQL Server client that we're going to use for Node.js. Um, it's currently requiring uh, to set and en enable a RIT abort either true or false. Um, otherwise, you get a a warning message if you don't specify what uh, a RIT abort. It should be true. One other thing I want to pa uh, pass on is, is a good tip. Um, a lot of times it, when you're deploying an application or changing environments or something like that, uh, it's real easy to miss adding a environment variable that's required uh, that your application expects. And if, if the environment variable is not specified, then, um, you know, it could cause issues in your application, some unexpected behavior, and you're thinking, you know, it might take a while to track down. So one pro tip I would say is uh, assert that all the values are at least present in uh, your configuration. So one way you could do that is to use the built-in assertion library that comes in, in Node. 
And then after you, you pull in all this information, just uh, use assertions. Assert that assert port. And just duplicate this for every um, every required environment variable. In the case of this application, every environment variable is required for this application to work like it's intended. So um, just as a, an exercise, if you want to add all those assertions into your own application, this could save you some headache down the road. Now we need to update the uh, the our main index uh, to change where we hard coded our configuration here to use our new config module. So up here we'll say const config equals require config. And we'll delete this. And now we can just pass the config into the server. Now we can get to the fun part. In this step, you're going to add uh, a route to Happy to query the database for a list of events and return them as JSON. You're going to create a, a SQL Server client plugin for Happy and organize your data access layer in a way that will make it easy to add new APIs uh, in the future. So first, we need to install some dependencies. The most important being the MS SQL package. So back to the command line, we're going to say npm install MS SQL version 6. And um, also in this step, we're going to install FS Extra version 9. FS Extra is or FS is the uh, built-in Node.js library for file system, like for reading and writing files. Um, I, per I personally like the FS Extra library um, that takes, that extends the built-in file system and gives, uh, gives some nice utilities um, around reading and writing JSON files. Back to the project, we're going to add our uh, data access layer. So under source, let's create a new folder named data. And under data, create a new file for index.js. Creating seek connections to SQL Server is a relatively expensive operation. There's a practical limit to the number of connections that you can establish. And by default, uh, the MS SQL packages connect function uh, creates and returns a pool of objects. Um, a connection pool increases the performance and scalability of an application. So, in the life cycle of a, of a Node.js application or an app or any type of application that that connects to a, uh, a a database like SQL Server, you're going to want to create that connection one time for the lifetime of the application and use that that same connection objects over and over again. So in, um, what we're going to do is set up a client that we can use from anywhere in um, our application to make those those queries. And then the client itself is going to handle, you know, creating an instance of a connection and keeping that connection alive uh, for the lifetime of the application. In this index.js file, we're going to require in um, an events module that we'll create in just a moment. Whoops. And we'll require in uh, the 
in my SQL module. And we're going to create our client function, which is an asynchronous function that takes in the happy server and our happy config. And we're going to uh, initialize a pool object. This is how we're going to keep that connection pool around. And we'll create a couple of internal functions on this uh, client. One is closed pool. So when the application is shutting down or for whatever reason needs to close the connection pool, it can do so. And then we'll create a, uh, a function called get connection. Check if pool already exists, then uh, return it. But if um, this is the first time uh, this connection uh, has ever been created, then we'll... Um, Create a new con connection pool. We'll set pool equal to await SQL dot connect. Passing in our our config, and then we'll we'll check if on error. If there's an, an extra, an error or anything, we'll just uh, force a, a closed pool. And then finally return our connection pool. And if there's a, an error, error of any type that's unhandled, we'll also console. Log this to the console and uh, set the pool equal to null just to be safe. Now finally, our uh, function that we're we're defining here, the client function, uh, we want to return something, and that's going that something is going to be an events object where the events are going to uh, expose functions for doing queries or operations on uh, the events table, the calendar table. We're going to pass in our SQL client and our get connection because those are two things that uh, every uh, data access layer uh, group of queries and, and commands are going to need the SQL object and uh, the get connection function. And then finally, we need to export the client. So just to reiterate, when using SQL Server with Node.js, one of the most critical things to get right is handling connection errors when they occur. And internally, this uh, SQL data module has two important functions that we've, that we've talked about, get connection and close pool. The get connection returns the active connection pool or creates one if necessary. 
And when any connection errors occur, the closed pool makes sure that the previously active connection pool is disposed to prevent the module from from uh, trying to to, uh, to to continue to reuse it. All right. So under the uh, source data folder, let's create a, a a new file called utils. And in here, I want to add some code that's going to help us to uh, uh, read in a bunch of uh, query files. Uh, we can define uh, SQL files um, as external .sql files and read those in when the application loads. We're using our the FS Extra module that we pulled in, and we're also going to uh, use the uh, join function that's part of the built-in path library for Node. And um, the path library or module uh, deals with uh, folder uh, file paths. We're going to create one function called load SQL queries that uh, you'll pass in a folder name we use the process current working directory and we'll say in the source folder under data look for this folder name by convention and then um, get a list of all the files that are in this folder and then um, filter that list of files to be only files that end with the uh, .sql extension. And then uh, let's initialize a, uh, a queries object. And then we'll loop over uh, for const the for of is is a really handy uh, newer convention for looping over uh, arrays and, and objects and so forth we're going to create a query by reading in That uh, those that file we're going to join with our file path, the name of the file, and we're going to specify encoding is UTF-8. Remove the, uh, the SQL extension from the file name and uh, so we're we're creating a property on this queries object that's set that specifies um, uh, for instance, maybe we have a, a, a query file named get event. And so queries.getEvent without the SQL connection is going to be equal to 
the contents of that get event dot sql file and finally return queries and now we're ready finished with that so let me back up and explain again it is possible to embed uh, SQL queries as strings in your JavaScript code. But I believe it's a better practice to keep your queries in separate SQL files and load them at startup using a utility like this. Uh, this utility module loads up uh, those, all the SQL files in a given folder and returns them as a single object. So, Next, we'll create a new folder under source data called events. Let's create a new file, index.js, and let's go ahead and create a new file um, called get events.sql. In uh, the index file, Let's read in um, the the require the utils module. And let's create a register function that's going to initialize all this. Uh, we're expecting a, a SQL connection, uh, a SQL object and a get connection function. Um, passed in. Uh, first, we want to read in all those SQL files. So we'll say SQL queries equals await utils dot load SQL queries and uh, passing in the folder name of events. And let's create a um, a get events function. Takes in a single user ID. We're going to create a, a get a connection from our uh, get connection function that was passed in. We're going to create a, a new request in the request we're going to define our our query parameters and uh, the, the query that we're going to use so in this request we'll say request dot input the user ID it's a um, var car 50 type and we're going to use the user ID that was passed in as the value and then we're going to return request.query using SQL queries dot get events again by convention uh, when this reads in all the uh, query files, it's going to expose a get events because this SQL file is named get events. And finally, um, our register function needs to return a uh, that we're we're exposing get events. Again, ES lint to the rescue. I forgot my equals. And now in this get events SQL file, let's add the query 
for getting a list of events. So we'll say select These are all our, our columns. Now, it's, it's not necessary to wrap all your column names in brackets, but it's, it's a good discipline. It's a good practice to get in, uh, in the habit of. Because we know that description is a, a key word, and we definitely need to wrap that in brackets. So we'll select those things from the events table where the user ID is equal to whatever value we pass in as the user ID parameter. And then we'll order these events by start date. So you, you're going to notice that we're in the in this SQL file and the SQL files that we create later on in the tutorial that we're using a parameterized query, and that's to guard against SQL injection attacks. You never want to see in any code, whether it's Node.js or Java or .NET or any language, building someone building a, a query string using um, by concatenating strings and values together. Always use parameterized queries. Next, we need to create a database client plugin uh, to make it easy to run those these SQL queries from other parts of our application. So from our routes, we want to be able to uh, initial or get our SQL client and and run a query to return from a particular API endpoint. Um, in other, as I mentioned before, in other frameworks like Express, uh, this concept is usually referred to as middleware, but in Happy uh, uses the term plugin. So under source, let's create a new folder called plugins. And in plugins, let's create a uh, a file named index.js. Lots of index.js files. Um, one of the reasons why index.js is used so much is that common JS um, recognizes index.js as a, like the default file in a folder. So it's a it's a shortcut. Um, it, you could name it anything that you wanted to, but when you require in uh, a module that's in a folder, you would have to specify require plugins slash whatever that file name is. Whereas uh, if you have an index.js file, this, you can use the shortcut require slash plugins and uh, it's going to automatically look for a file named index.js and read that in. And so it's just a convenience thing. So in this uh, plugins, um, index, we're going to create um, our uh, module. We're going to, um, we're also going to create a, a SQL plugin. So we're going to require in the SQL module. Now you've seen me use this uh, pattern quite a lot. This uh, creating a, a register function and expose exporting a register function on all these top level folders like the routes and the data plugins. Again, this is just a this is just a convention that I like to use. It's um, uh, with 
and specifically with Happy, uh, because Happy uh, also has a um, a register mechanism. Um, so I'm just kind of repeating that pattern uh, in my own code as a convention. Um, there's lots of ways uh, you can alternative ways to to register plugins and routes and so forth that uh, wouldn't require this but th this is something that I've I've come up with is that uh, as a project grows there's you'll always know that there's one place to go in any of these folders like the data folder or the plugins folder or the routes folder you want to go straight to that index.js and uh, see where uh, things are, are being registered when the application is initialized. So that's our main index. Let's create a new file called sql.js. We're going to require in our, our entire data folder. It's going to initialize all, all the uh, read in the SQL files and do all that kind of stuff. And then um, to be a plugin in the Happy ecosystem, you have to export a very specific looking uh, object. This object needs to have a name property. We'll call it SQL. It needs to have a version property. And we'll just set this to 1.0. And it needs to have a register function that takes um, takes in a server. Uh, when Happy registers plugins, it's going to pass the uh, server instance to every plugin so that you can do cool th things with the server. Um, we're going to grab the config. Remember, we, we stashed the config uh, for the entire application onto server.app. Well, now we can say server.app.config.sql. We're just going to grab the SQL object off of that config. And we're going to create our client. Passing in server and the config object, which is just the SQL connection information. And then last, we need to expose the client to the rest of the application. This is a mechanism that Happy has, um, this server.expose function. You can specify client, or specify the name of the property that you want to expose, and then the object or function that you want to expose. And what this does is, when uh, happy is initializing and it's registering all the plugins that you've defined. It's going to um, create a, uh, a an instance or, or, or provide a way for you to access those plugins from anywhere else in the application. So in this case, we're going to uh, expose um, the database client where we can get to it uh, easily from any of the routes anytime we need to. And finally, we need to update um, our, our server to uh, register those plugins. So we're going to add plugins, require in our plugins folder which is going to read the, the index.js file that's in the plugins folder. And then uh, after we create our instance of the happy server, after the config, then we need to await our plugins.register. So now our plugins will be properly registered. Well, our next step is to add an API route that'll execute the get events query and return results as JSON. You could add this route to the existing source routes uh, index, 
However, as an application grows, it's be better to separate routes into modules that contain related resources. So we're going to create a new folder under source routes and close some windows. Uh, we're going to create a new folder named API and in here create a new file of course index.js and this will be like um, an index.js that you know as we add more routes to the API we could just bundle those all into uh, this this index.js so we're going to require in um, our events API module that we'll build in just a second and then we'll export a register function that takes in the server and runs await events.register so let's also add a, an events .js file and in here let's um, export a register function that takes a server per, uh, argument and uses that server to register um, a route this time the method this, the method for this is also get the path will be API events and then we're going to set a config for this um, this route um, actually let's just let's just say handler now we don't need a, a config yet so we'll, we'll say our handler is an async uh, method it takes in a request and now we can um, let's wrap all this in a try statement go ahead and finish the try Oop. Another tip uh, while I'm here is that um, you don't have to use the console to log errors. Like in production, you probably want uh, an error logging mechanism. Uh, it's out of the scope of this tutorial, but you may want to look at something like Happy uh, Pino. Um, and there's lots of other loggers out there too. Uh, uh, Winston. Um, uh, can't think of any others off the top of my head, but uh, those would be better ways of, of logging uh, errors instead of just uh, logging them to the console. Uh, unless in production you have some way mechanism of capturing those console log errors and, and uh, capturing those in a way that you can get to them later. But for now, the console log will work just fine. So in our, our try statement, we can now get our database plugin right off of the request. So the request includes a server, and we know off of server we can access plugins using the plugins property, and our uh, plugin is registered under the name SQL because that was the name of the plugin, and then we exposed uh, the client uh, from that plugin when we registered it. So um, request.server and then from server you can get to plugins, SQL, and the client object. So now we have our, our database object and uh, for now we're just going to hard code in our user ID which is that user 1234. That's what we inserted into the database. And now we can say uh, let's get a, a wait db dot events because that's the uh, the data access layer as we were building that we created an events uh, object 
and uh, we have that one function on the events object get events and we'll pass in our user ID and then finally we'll return response dot record set now when you bring back a um, uh, a database response um, or uh, when the response from the from SQL Server comes back, it's got um, maybe some. I don't, I don't remember what all properties it has uh, off of that response, but it could include things like the number of records and you know just metadata about the uh, about the response. And uh, you know, uh, a SQL Server response can also include multiple record sets. Uh, could have multiple queries from like a stored procedure. Um, so the SQL client, uh, MS SQL module that we're using supports all those different scenarios. Uh, in this case, we just want the record set property off of the response and return that. And this, this automatically uh, returns it as JSON, which is why we, when we created the table in the first place, we used uh, the no, well, I can't remember if Camel Case or Pascal Case, whichever the case, which wh whatever the appropriate name is. Uh, you know, we start with the lowercase letter and have uppercases in the middle. Um, that's that's the convention that uh, you typically see with JSON data. That's why we named those uh, column names that way, so that we didn't have to do any mapping uh, when we to make it look more like JavaScript uh, or JSON. So that's all there is to it for the uh, the routes API. Now we need to update our routes main index to uh, register this new API. So in routes slash index, we'll um, require in our our API folder which will automatically load that, that index.js. And then in um, our regist register function, we'll await api.register passing in the server. And I think we're ready to test this. So let's go to our command prompt and type in node space our server is running we'll go to the, the server here we still got our first happy server but if we go to the route slash API slash events boom there's our JSON data uh, the two rows that we added to our SQL database early on in the tutorial. So we have a, a, a title of one or an ID of one, title of appointment, description is description stuff, and so forth. So that uh, that gives us what we expect. Well, now that we got this working, let's get some real users in our application. So manually building authentication and user profile management for any application is, is no trivial task. And getting it wrong can have disastrous results. You don't want to be rolling this stuff on your own. Uh, it would be better to have a, a security expert at your side. And that's what Okta does. To, so to complete this step, you're going to need a free Okta developer account. And to do that, you're going to go to the the Okta uh, portal, uh, developer.okta.com, and you can click the sign up button here at the top or the create free account. Uh, this account is always free. It's good for up to a thousand active users per month. Um, really has uh, everything that you could you could need for building um, applications and adding authentication, login, password resets, all, all that kind of stuff. So sign up for an account. And then after you sign up, then you'll be 
uh, at the Okta uh, dashboard. And from here, you want to click on Applications, click on Add Application. We're going to be, we're building a web application, so click on Web, and then click Next. And now you can name your application. Let's call this uh, Node SQL App. The uh, base URIs and, and all these things are already set up as we need them. Uh, I purposely choose chose to use port 8080 because I knew that you know we that's the, kind of the default for an application that we're building or adding in in Okta. So all these you can leave as defaults. Click Done. And now, um, on this page, under the General Settings, down at the bottom, there's a section labeled Client Credentials. These are the two values that we need to put into our uh, environment file. So click the little Copy to Clipboard icon. Now switch over to... Um, our application and go to the env file and we'll paste in the client ID uh, copy the client secret and paste that in and then last you need your org URL and to get that click on the dashboard to go back to the dashboard and you see Right here in the uh, in the top right, your org URL. So copy um, this URL, whatever that is. It'll be different from from mine, of course. And paste that in in your config. One last thing you may want to do is to enable self-service registration so that is what gives um, your customers the ability to uh, when they go to use your application if they don't already have a login there's a there'll be a link that says if you don't already have an account you can click here to sign up um, so it's it's basically adding a sign up link to the uh, login form and to do that you're going to go to the users menu go to registration and on this page, there's a you look for this self-service registration. If it's uh, enabled, great. If it's not, click Edit, change this to Enabled, and save it. There's also other things on this form, like if you want to add uh, additional profile uh, data to your login and registrations. All right, that's done. So now. We need to build our UI. And these next steps, um, we're going to add a front end to our Node.js application using embedded JavaScript templates, or EJS, and Vue.js. Uh, first, we need to install some dependencies to support our authentication, rendering those templates, and serving up static files. So let's go to the command line. We can stop our server now. We're going to npm install um, happy bell, which is an OAuth uh, authentication uh, library for happy. Happy boom, which is a error handling uh, response library. Happy cookie, which is a cookie uh, session authentication session management system for um, for happy we're going to install happy inert uh, which is used for serving static files uh, the cookie we need to install version 11 and boom is going to be version uh, 9 let's see what else inert uh, we need Happy Vision, which is the um, template engine 
uh, allows us to bring in different uh, whatever kind of template engine that we want for server side rendering and then uh, we need EJS uh, the embedded JavaScript templates and that is at version ah, 3 so let's install these and now let's go back to the application and we need to add a um, an authentication plugin for our application whoops I went too far So under our plugins folder, let's create a new file named auth.js. We're going to require in uh, our bell module. Man, I can't type. And we need our cookie module and let's check if we're running in secure uh, a secure environment uh, meaning like uh, SSL TLS um, and we'll just assume that's based on our um, node envi node environment environment variable so if it's if we're running in production, then we're going to assume that uh, we're also running under using SSL certificates. Uh, otherwise, in development, um, we're just using plain HTTP. So module.exports. We're exporting a, a, a JavaScript object, which is our, our plugin definition. So just like our SQL plugin, we have a name property. We're going to call this auth uh, version, default to 1.0. And we need a register function that takes in a server, the happy server. And we're going to await server.register those uh, plugins that we need, the bell and the, and the cookie plug in and now we need to grab our configuration off of the server server.app.config and we need to define a couple of uh, what happy calls strategies uh, authentication strategies so the first authentication strategy is for our our uh, cookie sessions, so it's a session. We're using the cookie uh, plugin, and then the configuration for our cookie plugin is uh, the the name. We're going to name it Octa OAuth. We need a path. need to set a password which is going to be our our cookie uh, password that's defined in the environment file and then whether or not this is secure and we need to set our redirect if if someone's not logged in we need to redirect them to a, a new uh, route of authorization code slash callback. That's one strategy. We need to add another strategy for our uh, OAuth Octa based uh, login. So everything else in the application is going to be using session cookies. Uh, if the session cookie is not there, it's going to redirect to um, to the Okta authentication strategy, which will 
trigger a an Okta login. So in here, we're going to call this strategy Okta, which uses the Bell plugin and the configuration for this plugin. The provider is Okta config is um, we need to specify the URL URI for um, where to go uh, when the person needs to log in and that is specified using the, our Okta URL in our config we need a um, to set the using the same cookie password which I just realized did not spell that correctly up here also specifies whether it's secure the location is our config.url which is in our environment variables set to localhost colon 8080 and we need our client ID which comes from our environment variables under config.octa.client ID and the client secret and I think that's all and we're going to set the default strategy for our website to session. So all routes that are configured to use authentication will default to session. And if the person using the website is not logged in as a session and that route requires authentication, then they'll be redirected to the, uh, the Okta strategy which will log them in, uh, set them on the flow of, of logging into Okta or registering with Okta if they don't already have an account. Last thing we want to do is, this is just a, a really nice, um, uh, this is it's kind of like a bonus tip uh, of using Happy. Uh, what we're going to do is create a an extension on, on Happy that is like uh, hooking into a a request lifecycle event. So on pre-response, like this means uh, in on every request that's made to the happy server before the response is sent back uh, or 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 processed uh, by the uh, by the route, we want to intercept that and de and add some some of our own information. To that response. So this also takes in a request and the uh, the happy toolkit and we're going to check is the request response a a view. So we're we're filtering out like calls to the API. We only want uh, this to be triggered when um, when a view is being rendered and sent to the client. So if it's a view, then we're going to say, um, let's check to see if the... Um, person requesting this is authenticated. If they are, then we're going to set some some values. Is authenticated? Is true? Is anonymous? Is false? The email address of the of the current person is can be found under request .auth .artifacts profile email. First name is also available.
That's first name. And then last name. And if they're not authenticated, then we want to um, say is authenticated is false, is anonymous, is true, email is an empty string, first name is an empty string, last name is an empty string. So there's our auth object, and we want to decorate the response, the context, uh, with this auth object. And we'll be able to use this context within our views, our view templates, to check is the, is the current person uh, authenticated or not. And if they are, we can quickly be able to access their email and first name and last name if we want to um, put that in the, uh, the response. And then finally, after all this, we want to return h.continue. So this is just part of the, the life cycle of a response. Now we need to update our plugins, uh, index.js, to register our auth plugin, as well as the other plugins that we've recently brought in, like the, like the EJS uh, templates. So in here, we're going to require in EJS inert for static files vision for our template engine support And then bring in our our own auth plugin. And now let's update our register function to not just register one. Um, well, let's see. Instead of just registering the SQL function, we'll register an array of objects, which will be our auth, the inert, vision, and SQL. And then we need to configure our server view engine. So we'll use, we'll do that by saying server.views and our configuration, the uh, engines we're using, we're only using one, EJS is relative to, this is the path to, to where to find these templates, and um, we're going to use the built-in under, underscore underscore dir name, uh, which is just a, a built-in Node.js shortcut for getting the, the current directory of the, uh, the application. And then the path to our templates is going to be uh, in the templates folder. Sorry, the dir name is actually pointing to like the current plugins folder that that uh, this module is running in. And we're going to specify that layout is true, so we're going to have a a layout template. Um, and the engine will look for a file specifically named layout.ejs to be like the, the wrapper uh, template that goes around every page. All right. So let's add our, our server templates uh, under the source folder, create a new folder name templates and we'll create that layout file layout.ejs and I'm going to
just copy in some code here and walk you through what this looks like. Some, so HTML code, um, we got a doc type, HTML, a head um, that includes uh, a title. So this title is using uh, some EJS syntax to, when, when it renders on the server, it's going to look for some data that's passed to this view um, that includes uh, a title uh, value. And it's going to inject that into the title tag. Um, we're setting or, or referencing a, uh, a material icons font from Google. And we're specifying that we're uh, using an index.css file, which we'll add in a, in a moment. We're including a uh, navigation partial. So this is a way of injecting yet another template into the current template. And then our, uh, our content. So all the other templates that are using this layout, this is where this content will go. And then we've got a script tag here at the bottom that includes an index.js, which we'll also add in a, in a little while. So we need to uh, next add a new template for our home page, index.ejs. And again, I'm just going to copy in a whole bunch of um, code to save some time. And in this container, um, we're using a container class, so we're going to be using um, Material um, CSS as like a CSS framework. So our class is container. If um, the current user is authenticated, then show them uh, render this app div. If they're not authenticated, then render a header with a, a message and a login button. Um, so depending on if you're logged in or not, it's going to change the way that the page is rendered. And I jumped ahead. I copied in too much stuff. Way too much stuff. Whoops. So that's all we need for the index.ejs. The next is um, we need to edit... A, uh, a template for our partials. So under um, the templates, we need our navigation partials. So create a file named, or a folder named partials. And in partials, create a file named navigation.ejs. And here, we're going to create a nav... Um, a nav tag and um, again we're using the is authenticated to conditionally show a login or logout button and this is where the um, in both of these cases of the of the home page and this navigation file we're looking is is the current person authenticated and the way we're able to get that information is because we we added that to the response um, the on pre-response event. Uh, we injected that on every view. So now it's available anytime we need it. So now we need to update our routes to support the, the views and authentication. So open up uh, your source.routes folder and let's create a new route named auth. So a new file named auth.js and in here, we're going to, to uh, bring in our boom module. Um, we're going to define a login, and these. This is just what I'm. What I'm about to show you is an alternative way that you can define some routes. Um, 
and register those routes. So in the past, we've just done server.route and specified the config in there. We can also create um, uh, individual JSON or individual JavaScript objects of those routes and then register them all at once uh, with one server.register command. So that's what we're about to do. So our login route, um, the method is get path is login and then we're going to specify some configuration for this um, for this thing so the handler you know what we don't really need to specify an option let's let's just create a handler which takes in a request and if the request dot auth is authenticated if it's not authenticated then we're going to return a message We should probably never see this message, but um, just putting this in here for, for safekeeping, just in case. Uh, we need our define our callback route for OAuth, OAuth callback, and this is also a get. The path is authorization code callback the handler is a takes in a request and the toolkit and if the request is not authenticated then we throw a boom error. Boom has a number of um, default response types. So there's a boom unauthorized. Are authenticated then we need to set the uh, session cookie so we're going to use request dot cookie off dot set set that to the request off credentials and then return h dot redirect back to the home page in this case, we're going to set our options. The auth strategy for this particular route is Okta. And that's when it's going to trigger um, if the person is not logged in, uh, if there's no session, it's going to redirect them to, to Okta to log in. We also need a logout route. which is a get pass path is logout if the person is authenticated then we're going to clear the session cookie. And then redirect them back to the home page. And in 
our options, we're going to set the, the off mode to try. And what, what, there, there are several, there are, I think, two or three off modes that you can choose from. Uh, the try means it's going to, um, check to see if there's any authentication information available and it'll populate the request.auth object. Um, if auth mode was set to none, then request.auth would not be populated with anything, even if that current request, um, that person is logged in. And then request.mode, uh, I think it's called always, um, or uh, required, it's one of those, um, it will check to see if someone's logged in. If they're not logged in, it will uh, initiate the, uh, the strategy to, to, to start a login. All right, now we have our, our three routes defined. We need to uh, register those. So we're going to export a register function that takes in a server and we're going to just register all these at once. Now we need to update our uh, homepage route so that it renders our EJS view instead of returning a string. So under source routes index, uh, instead of returning this, we need to render our view. And we also need to register our um, auth. So after we register the server, we'll await on, uh, or after we register the API, we'll register uh, the auth routes and our homepage route, we will change um, the handler to return uh, h.view, we're using the index route, and let's set the title to home. That's how you pass data. Uh, you can pass a, a JavaScript object um, with a bunch of properties and things. Uh, to a view, so the EJS template has that data to to work with, and then um, under options, we want to have our auth mode also equal to try. We also need a static route for our static files uh, for like the index.css and and JavaScript that we'll create. In a, in a little while and this is a get the path is really anything and uh, if we this is like a catch-all if it does, if it doesn't already find another route uh, that's explicitly defined, like a like our login, our home page, our logout route, if 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 none of those routes match a current request, then this catch-all uh, route will will handle it. And we're going to set this to uh, a directory with the past path of uh, dist. Uh, 
this will be a folder that's that's created for us automatically by our build process. It's going to um, build our front end for us and generate uh, our JS file and our, our CSS file. Well, now that we have our um, authentication added to the application, we need to update our API to query the database based on the current logged in user. And at minimum, we also need to create some API routes for creating, updating, and deleting events along with those respective SQL queries. So let's go ahead and add some of those queries. We're going to go to the uh, data events folder and create a new file named addEvent.sql. And I'm just going to copy in some, some code here to save some time. And uh, this is just an insert statement taking in the um, all the different columns we have. And then we're passing in all the values as query string, or not query string, passing those in as parameter parameters. So this is a parameterized query. And then after the insert, we're going to return the, the newly generated ID uh, using the, uh, the scope identity SQL function that returns the... Uh, the automatically generated ID. Now let's create an uh, update SQL. Let's, we'll call this update event dot SQL. Again, copy in some some code here, and uh, very similar to the insert. This is an update events, setting the title to the uh, Parameters, title, description, start date, so forth. I uh, see a little typo there. Um, where the ID is, the ID and the user ID specified. And then after updating it, return back the newly updated um, data. Just as a, a double check. And then um, let's create a delete event. And uh, this one's really short. I'm just going to delete the uh, from the events table where ID is equal to uh, the ID parameter and the user ID is equal to user ID. And now let's update our events dot index uh, JavaScript file to uh, use those those queries. So in the um, in the get events where we um, I'm just gonna copy in some code to save some time. So we need an add event and that's gonna take in an uh, JavaScript objects that were that's destructured um, into the user ID, title, description, and so forth. Um, just like the the get events, we'll we'll get a uh, the pool off the uh, we'll get a connection. Um, this needs to be doesn't have to be, but just to make things consistent, we'll get the request, and we're setting all these values on for parameters, and then running the query and returning the results. These could be um, these could be awaits, but the request.query um, is a a, a promise-based, so it'll it'll work with the async and await as well. And then we need an update event. Again, I'll rename this to connection for consistency. The update event looks almost identical to the to the add or the insert statement, except uh, we're using a also including the ID of the event that we want to update, and then a delete 
event. And finally, we need to return those functions uh, fr from here. So the client has those. Now let's update the, um, the API route under events. And instead of hard coding in the uh, the user ID, uh, we need to uh, get the actual uh, user ID that's that's requested. One thing we need to do is we need to set the options on this handler or this uh, route so that the auth mode is set to to try. So that our authentication information is populated and then uh, at the very top of our handler we'll check is the current user authenticated if not we'll return an unauthorized error now we don't have boom, uh, we need to pull that in. And then we can get the current user ID instead of hard coding that value. We can get that off of the request.auth.credentials dot profile dot id and everything else stays the same and we also need um, uh, routes for uh, creating events and deleting events and updating events I'm going to add a couple here just by by pasting these in and I'll I'll walk through what these do. So here's a route to um, to create a new event. Again, the auth mode is try. We check to see if it's uh, authenticated or return unauthorized if not. And then um, we're going to pull the start date, start time, all these values out of the request.payload. So when you post a uh, JSON document, a JSON object to an API endpoint that, um, that is uh, made available through Happy using the request.payload uh, object. So we're pulling all those values off of the payload and then we're uh, calling our API, our, uh, our data access layer client using the add event object or function passing in all those parameters and we expect uh, coming back from that update or that insert the uh, the ID of the newly created event and uh, if there's an error uh, let's uh, console log that error and and then return uh, <laughs> there's a short a utility function on Boom called Boomify. It'll turn any error into a happy Boom error. So we're returning Boomify that error. And then finally, uh, let's add a delete route. Um, and this route is a delete verb. And it takes in a, uh, this is how you specify in the path a, a parameter um, as part of the path. So events, we're, we got a placeholder here for ID. And we get to that ID using request.params.id. So instead of request.payload, which takes the, uh, the, 
the data that was posted, uh, we're, use, we're using params.id that gets the parameters off of the, the path of the URI. So we get the user ID from our credentials and we call delete event using the ID of the, uh, the event and the current user ID. If, um, if it was successful, if the rows affected is equal to one, then we return a response code of um, 204. Uh, if we don't get a record back, then uh, we return not found. Again, if there's an error, we'll log this to the console and return uh, a boomified version of that error. Now, we could do an update route here too. Uh, I'm going to leave that up to you as a as an exercise. It should be very very similar to the um, create event, except instead of a post verb, it'd be a put verb. And you could use, uh, just like the delete, you could add an, an ID uh, on the path. Or you could make it part of the, of the put statement, either way. All right, now let's, um, we're going to create our UI for our application. And uh, we're going to use, as I mentioned before, uh, Material CSS and view and then some some other components that'll uh, help us make uh, the application better so let's move over to back to the uh, the command line and we're going to install some dependencies so npm install we're going to use uh, axios uh, version 0.19 to do some to to actually do the communication from the client front end to the API. Uh, Luxon is, is part of um, Luxon is part of the uh, date time UI that we're going to be creating. Materialized CSS framework version one, uh, the moment library version two, view a view date time component, and uh, another component called week start. All right, now let's create a folder in the um, in the application ah, I did it again close too many windows let's create a folder in the application in the root and we'll call this client so in the client we're going to create a new file index.js and um, in here, I'm going to put some, copy in some code. Notice we're using uh, uh, the new module syntax for, for JavaScript. We're going to import the date time module, uh, import the view, materialize CSS frameworks, our date time. CSS, um, and we're going to import app from a, a new app component that we'll create. We're going to use that date time component, register that with view, and create a new view application and, and register that with the uh, app uh, div tag that's in the front end. Now, it, going explaining uh, what all view does and, and uh, how to use view is out of the scope of this this tutorial uh, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along and see how these things work um, but this is the code for our index we need to create a app view component 
And in here is a, another big block of code. Again, I unfortunately I don't. Um, it's out of the scope of this tutorial to go through all of it or to go through it line by line, but hopefully you can follow along uh, what some of these things are doing. Its view is a includes a template um, where we can have these uh, uh, braces in there that that are like tokens for the different data that we want to uh, join with this template. So these are client side templates. Uh, as opposed to server side templates that are in EJS. So Vue is our is our basically our template engine for doing client side rendering. So in our um, we're going to loop through the events that we get back from the API and and populate a, a table on the front end. And then we have uh, some forms on the front end like uh, we're going to add an event and uh, this add event has a start date and a start time and we're using the date time components to be able to uh, show some some nice UI uh, based components that are going to be like a, a calendar type object or a, a time um, component to work with and when we run the application you'll see um, how that m makes the the experience a little bit nicer. So this is all our, our the HTML for the forms, and we have some HTML for a delete confirmation. So if we're deleting an event, it pops up this um, um, message box that asks for confirmation, and based on whether they click the user clicks on delete or cancel, um, there's some behavior. And then also as part of this component, we're defining. The, the JavaScript that goes with it. So as I mentioned before, we're using Axios to uh, do the the API calls from the front end. Uh, we've got materialize in our moment. Um, and uh, as part of this view component, we have some a number of computed um, properties. We have a data property that includes you know all the information for a single event and we have these methods defined like add event and uh, the axios will post that to our api we have a confirm delete event a delete event which actually does the the delete calls that delete api endpoint and then we have some other functions such as format date and format time and um, uh, formats the events that come in and then finally, we have a load events that calls calls that API endpoint that that get endpoint and uh, returns all those events and reformats those for display. And we also view has a some lifecycle uh, functions, and one is called mounted. Uh, we're using the mounted event to know that the uh, the component has finished. Uh, rendering the initial view and uh, now it's safe to go and fetch all the events that are currently uh, associated with the, the user and load those into the UI. And then we have some some style, a, a few customized style elements. So let's save this. Now um, to generate the UI um, we're using as I said before, um, the latest import uh, module, import and export module syntax. We're using you know some things that are modern JavaScript, and th those things might not be available to every browser. We're also pulling in modules like um, the materialized CSS. We need a way to build all this stuff uh, so that it's it's in a, a package that we can deliver to. Uh, a browser. So we're going to create a build process that will do all these steps that we need to, to generate a final JavaScript file, a final CSS file. And so we need some dependencies for our build process. So let's go back to the command line and let's 
use npm install this time these are these are development dependencies uh they don't need we're not needed for production we're going to build everything that we need uh at the time of deployment um and not um, rebuild anything during production so uh we need we're going to use nodemon which is uh not necessary for um building our assets but this is a really nice utility that will make uh, your life as a developer much easier. Nodemon uh, monitors your project directory for any changes to files and then restarts your Node.js application. So you don't have to uh, continually be going back and uh, using Control-C to stop a web application and restart it. Uh, Nodemon does that for you automatically. So we need Nodemon. Uh, we're going to use MP run, npm run all, which is a nice little utility to r chain together a bunch of uh, npm scripts. We're going to use parcel bundler um, to do our, our bundling process of Vue and CSS and JavaScript. So, um, parcel is similar to Webpack, but it's it's kind of like zero config, zero code. Um, by default, it can understand a lot of different uh, front-end projects and create a uh, uh, appropriate bundle of those. So that's just uh, a way of saving some time. We need um, a view component compiler utils for our, um, our bundling process and a view template compiler version 2 all right now that that's done let's update our package json file uh, to include some build scripts so uh, package json is a uh, has a or node.js with npm has a way of defining scripts that um, we don't have to use something like gulp or grunt or any of the other kind of script runners we can use npm itself to do a lot of those kinds of things so in the scripts uh, we'll define a build script that's going to use parcel to build the uh, client folder and the entry point that we want to point it to is index.js. Um, we're going to define a dev script, which will use nodemon, and we're going to specify that it watch the client folder, um, and we want it to watch the source folder, uh, both of those, for any changes. And the file types that we want it to watch include JavaScript, EJS, SQL, Vue, and CSS. So if we make a change to any of those types of files, Nodemon will detect that and restart um, the application. So if it detects one of those things, then we tell it to run, use npm run dev start what's dev start uh, we also need to define that so dev start is npm run all build and start so we need a start um, script and that is just simply run node with a uh, in the current directory and that's it you can run any script defined in your command or terminal line with the npm run label and um, as I mentioned before nodemon is a fantastic utility so the only thing we need to do now is come back here and run npm run dev and that should run uh, nodemon and kick off our build process Hmm, 
I don't think it ran our our uh, build process. So let's go back and, and look at this again. npm run dev start. Oh, I forgot to include uh, an exec parameter. So exec tells it what command to actually run and not just run uh, node. By default, it does something like this. Um, but if we want it to specify a particular uh, script to run, we need to use the exec parameter. So let's try that again. npm run dev. This time, it kicks off parcel. Now we have our local host running. Oh no, an internal error. Well, let's switch over to the console and see what uh, what's going on. All right, so there's an internal error, a reference to message is not defined. Oh, so our home page is expecting to get a message sent to the template and we're not passing a message we're just passing the title so let's go over to the um the templates folder under source or actually the template's fine remember it's looking for a, a message in the paragraph so we need to go to our routes for the home page and we're just passing title is a home, let's also pass a message of something like welcome. Now what should happen is that Nodemon Node -mon recognizes the change we just made to the file and automatically restarts the, the uh, server. So if we go back to the browser and refresh the page, boom, we get our login. Something strange, though, is going on here. We're not getting any of the stylings that we would expect to get, and I think I know what the problem is. So in our index.js, when we just uh, created this server route, um, we did not specify that the... Uh, um, The auth mode should be um, set. Actually, this auth mode, we can just set this to false. And so our server restarts. Let's try it again. Now we get the, uh, the stylings like we'd expect. And we click on the login button. It's going to prompt us to log in to our Okta uh, account. And um, since we have self-registration turned on, there's a link down here that says if you don't have an account, you can sign up for an account. It's really cool. Oh no, we got another error. What's what do we got happening this time? Cannot read property first name of undefined. So I must have messed something up with the uh, the data. Maybe I miss misspelled something. So in our routes um, auth plugin or let's see our auth plugin <laughs> instead of profile I called it process you probably saw me make that mistake let's try it again so it automatically restarted and now we have our events. We have no events yet because the two dummy events that we added to the application 
database earlier. Uh, those are no longer in there. So click on start date and we've got a nice little calendar pop up here. And time, we've got a nice uh, time picker. So let's say 3 p.m. And uh, we won't specify the end date and we'll call the appointment just um, um, coffee. Of course, you could set that for every hour of the day as far as I'm concerned. And we'll click Submit, and that goes off and makes an API request to insert that data into the database and returns, uh, updates our list of events up here. So if I were to refresh the page, we still get a list of the one event. Let's add uh, one more event. Let's say, uh, kind of like our conference, we'll say, it starts on April the 1st and ends on April the 2nd. So this is a virtual conference. Submit that. And now we got our um, virtual conference. If we want to delete one of these, we click delete and it's going to ask us to confirm. If we click OK, then it calls the API to delete that from the database and refreshes our list of events. So I declare this application a success. Well, I hope you liked learning about Node.js and using SQL Server, a little bit about Happy and uh, how to authenticate your application with Okta. Um, if you like the content, please Click the thumbs up and subscribe so that you can find uh, content from us in the future. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great day.